God bless you. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you this morning, and uh, we want to welcome you to the first daytime session of the Empowered Conference. We had a wonderful evening last night in the presence of the Lord, and a uh, number of people received healings, and uh, all, all through the night, I kept getting messages on my phone uh, from people that were at the meeting and uh, received healings. Uh, they, they continued receiving healings after the session was over. Uh, received, I woke up this morning to a message from a woman in our congregation who's been struggling with lupus and uh, has been uh, living in tremendous pain, uh, daily pain, constant chronic pain. And she said, I woke up this morning and there's absolutely no pain in my body. So thank you, Jesus. And uh, I, believe, I believe the Lord has uh, more for us. So if I haven't met you, my name is Glenn. I'm the pastor here at Harvest Time Church. And we welcome all of you. Just before Randy comes to teach, a couple quick housekeeping things for you. Um, we do want to let you know that we do have restrooms uh, on both levels of the building, uh, in the upper lobby, just outside the sanctuary doors, in the lower lobby. Uh, we do have water and granola bars uh, out there uh, for you to just enjoy as you might need to refresh yourself. Uh, our friend Napo is running the coffee cart. And uh, Napo... Uh, uh, does the coffee cart at Resting Place House of Prayer in New Jersey, uh, and he brought his coffee cart with us. He makes the best latte. Uh, he's a he's a YouTube guru. He has like a million followers on YouTube. He teaches people how to make lattes with the little hearts and smiley faces on top. And so go out and see Napo if you if you want a coffee to refresh yourself. I do want to let you know that we have four food trucks that are coming uh, uh, over the lunch hour. And so uh, there is a lunch break today, and you might like to get food. Uh, some, we have some delicious choices, healthy choices in the food trucks. So you might want to just stay right here on campus and help yourself to something from the food truck. Or you can go off campus and come back again. Uh, any way that I or my staff can serve you throughout the day, just look for any of us that are wearing the little harvest time uh, badges on our lapel, and if there's anything that we can do to serve you, uh, to make you comfortable, and uh, to help you through the day, we'll be happy to do that. Uh, why don't we just stand on our feet, and let's give uh, a very warm welcome to our friend, Dr. Randy Clark. I know we, is it after uh, lunchtime also the pastors luncheon with, uh, okay. Uh, how many pastors do we have here this morning? I want to see who the pastors are. Just lift your hands high and, okay. Um, before I speak, I want to, again, I, I mentioned last night that usually I will share either before or after uh, I get done teaching, um, but I felt like... I know that I'm going to go into some ministry time after the teaching today, and uh, so I want to talk about some of the product that we have out on the table. Uh, that can, for me, it makes me feel better about what I'm not getting to teach, because I, uh, you say, well, one of the frustrating things when I used to do conferences, and I really don't like doing conferences. I only do them to get, you know, to meet people uh, and to have an opportunity to go into another network and minister there and and because it's what's so frustrating is you usually get to speak twice and you're thinking well what am I going to speak on and I like to try to have things balanced and I don't mean mediocre and I don't mean lukewarm I just mean balance between uh, this truth this truth is true but if you push this truth and you don't balance it with this truth, this one gets out of balance. And I, and I get frustrated when I can't do that. And so the way our schools actually started out is I got so frustrated. I said, I just am tired of going in and teaching two times when there's so much more that needs to be taught. And I thought, well, I could say, share everything I wanted to if I could do 24 <laughs> sessions. 
And I could, I could teach everything I wanted on healing 24 sessions. And then after about a year, then we started a second school with 24 more sessions. Uh, but we did repeat three, the impartation message and the words of knowledge message and the five-step prayer model. We repeat those in, usually in all the schools. And then we had a, a school of 24 sessions that dealt with medical and spiritual perspectives. And then the fourth school that we created, which is each one of them's 24 sessions, dealt with uh, faith's relationship to healing. And uh, it was um, a friend of mine who was an apostolic leader in the Word of Faith movement, uh, a CMA, former professor at Oral Roberts University, and my ex exec, um, vice president now, and myself was, were teaching. So we have four schools, each one with 24 sessions. So there's a lot of things, even in this uh, to the two and a half days, that we're not going to get to share. And so I can tell you at least where you can find uh, some more of the teachings that we have on healing. For those of you who are pastors, uh, you will know down on the table, I think I have three uh, curriculums. Is that right? Just have, two. Just have two. Which one don't I have? Okay, I don't have the um, Essential Guide to Healing curriculum. Well, we have three curriculums, two of them with us, Power to Heal and Authority to Heal. Um, if, you're, uh, if I was starting out and wanting to train a ministry team, the first thing I would do is I would get... The, our manual on ministry team training manual. Uh, this tells you how to look at heart standards, um, what, just very practical things. And you can take this as in 17 languages now. We've had a lot of apostolic people say as the best uh, training manual that they'd seen. The last 42 pages only deals with deliverance. We got permission from Doris Wagner to use her um, intake for like a pastoral context of doing deliverance rather than crusade context and the crusades if you know if the demons manifest you just they would carry them to anaconda's deliverance tent and we were our model of doing deliverance we learned from uh, pablo botari who was the trainer for anaconda for 12 years and he oversaw when we were working with him he'd already oversaw overseen 60,000 um, deliverances by that time and so that's what the deliverance is about. And then we have, you know, uh, how to pray for specific things. It deals with the five-step prayer model. It deals with words of knowledge. And it deals with difficult situations. And, and just a lot of very, very practical things that you could take and actually use for uh, your ministry team. And that's, that's this one. This morning, I'm going to be bringing two messages to you. And those messages are in this little booklet this is called the message series, Thrill of Victory and the Agony of Defeat. So you can take copious notes or you can just relax and enjoy and buy this and not worry about the notes. Um, and then I mentioned it and something my son told me, some of the people out at the books table said, I've already been baptized in the Spirit. Yeah, that's what I like about this book. Because I'm going to tell you that your second baptism in the Spirit or your third could be more powerful than your first. And if you, if, you, if you believe there's only one and you've had it, which, by the way, I, I, I agree with those that uh, say, based on the Scripture, in my opinion, um, that being filled with the Spirit is a synonymous term with being baptized in the Spirit, and it is in Scripture. Acts 2 Day of Pentecost, they did not call that baptized in the Spirit. They called it being, they were filled. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. So it proves that being filled with the Spirit is a synonymous term in Scripture for being baptized with the Spirit. Um, and there are perspectives in this that you would have probably have not ever heard of. Um, they're going to learn about how in the early church for the several first hundreds of years, how that they felt like that if a person was born again, but they weren't filled with the Holy Spirit or baptized in the Spirit, then the, 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 their pastor had done them a great error. He said it's like recruiting somebody into the uh, military, but never giving them the weapons to fight with. And uh, it was seen to be a very uh, bad thing. If, if you allowed, if you didn't get people completed, they would say, 
For example, some of the leaders of the early church would say that um, when, when someone comes to Christ and they've been baptized and given their life to God, they are now fitted to receive the Holy Spirit in the sense of being filled with the Spirit because they believe that there was regenerated by the Spirit and then filled with the Spirit. And being filled with the Spirit was seen in the early church as subsequent to having been born of the Spirit, both in timing. Uh, there was the, the baptism, and then following water baptism, there was the anointing with oil and praying that they would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And also, in a, in a new book I got coming out, uh, there on the handbook on the gifts of the Spirit in, in March, uh, they talk about even there in the baptismal, like they were immersed in the first several hundred years uh, uh, in the early church, um, they said, "Wow, lift up your hands and believe that the Father wants to give you his gifts of the Spirit. And it, would, uh, it was to be seen as an activation even of the gifts of the Spirit. So there's a lot in this. Uh, I, it deals with some of the, um, uh, for example, it would deal with the evangelical view of the baptism of the Spirit, the holiness view, the Pentecostal view, and the Catholic perspectives on baptism of the Spirit. And then I talk about the traditional and recent Pentecostal perspectives on the baptism of the Spirit, the scriptural basis for the traditional Pentecostal and evangelical positions, the baptism of the Holy Spirit according to the early church fathers and early church historians, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, Protestant and Catholic perspectives, baptism of the Holy Spirit, the holiness and Pentecostal perspectives, and then a chapter on experiencing the baptism of the Spirit and... Um, or a section, and one was receiving, and the other is, uh, it's the Spirit who testifies. The third part of this book was written by my favorite professor. I paid him, because uh, I think a workman's worthy of his hire, so I paid him to write this third section, and he's a, a, he taught the Ph.D. program at Regent, he developed a Ph.D. program at Regent Divinity School, and he's a professor emeritus of Regent and he's also was my mentor in the DMN program at United Theological Seminary. And he wrote the best book that's ever been written. It is the gold standard. Nothing even comes a close second to refuting cessationism. Um, and it's called On the, on the Cessation of the Charismata, Protestant Polemic on Post-Biblical Miracles. And his understanding of um, the Holy Spirit baptism and what Jesus did at the cross is so radical in the sense of returning to the original meaning that's the meaning of radical in the sense we're using it that uh, I asked him would you develop what you believe is important here because he, he told me he said Randy almost all charismatic theology and renewal theology and even Pentecostal theology took traditional Protestant theology and bolded onto it a section about the Holy Spirit but didn't realize that it went much deeper than just now we have the gifts as an option. It was, very, it, was, it, was, it was much deeper than that. So there's a section on that, and then the last section is uh, equipping the saints and re deal with revival and baptism of the Spirit, and also the, the baptism in the Spirit's connection to even the, the, the prophetic a call to social justice and giving people the power. I actually have a friend who is a very liberal, in a, not political, but, uh, well, he would be politically too, but uh, theologically uh, a liberal, um, who worked down in Nicaragua, who works in the prisons, and um, he burned out uh, just doing wonderful things and uh, very, I think, important things, but he burned out. And here you got this liberal Old Testament professor who had, for 20 years, worked with the poorest of the poor around the world, and he burned out, and he got touched by the Holy Spirit, filled, and was just was given great joy and laughter. It renewed him, and now he goes to places I could never get into, uh, particularly with the the peace movements uh, like, you know, the Brethren Church, which is a, a pacifist denomination and, and uh, 
so he gets in and he actually talked to this college where I finally did get into and said, you know, Randy only lives like two miles from this college. You ought to have him come in. So uh, uh, he opened the door for me. So anyway, there are things in here that you probably have not read or, or have. And I wanted to encourage you that that's what the book There Is More is about. Just because you've been baptized in the Holy Spirit doesn't mean you've got all that there is that God has to give. I was baptized in the Holy Spirit, but the second baptism was stronger. The th- third had the most effect. And I'm crying out for a fourth. And I'm overdue. <laughs> I really am. Uh, so anyway, if you're a pastor, I started talking about the curriculum. If you're a pastor, I encourage you, this is the curriculum I would start out. We have a lot of pastors that actually have taken it. And if you don't, you're not a pastor, you just you want to get the book. Power to Heal. This is a very practical one. This is what I would say. This would be 101. Essential Guide to Healing Curriculum would be 201. And Authority to Heal, I think, would be 301. I wouldn't start with it. I would start with this one. We have a lot of pastors said we took this and we took it into our Sunday school or we took it into our small groups of our church and the whole water level for experiencing the supernatural really did, uh, really was raised uh, higher. And uh, there's training manual, there's a workbook, there's the, uh, this book and, um, well, I said tra- there's a leader's guide and then there's, I think it's uh, eight DVDs that you can show as you're in your small group or in your home as you're doing the, uh, doing the lesson. It's all put together. So, let's see. Well, so which one do you want of these? Which one? This one? Okay. Come get it. All right. Uh, another pastor. Tell me what denomination you're from. And come and get what you want. There you go, Lord. You're welcome. Good to see you again. Which one you want? Okay. Uh, William, would you take it to him? This one, baptized in the Spirit. Okay. All right, one more pastor. The guy right there. Which one? Christian fellowship. I don't know. You say that. Yeah, Christian fellowship. Do you, do you want this one? <laughs> I, I can't give those away. <laughs> but I felt like you're shortchanged. So, when you can take this out to my son who's running the table. And if you see another book, not one of these, but another book, <laughs> you can trade it in, get what you want. Here you go, William. I mentioned last night, and by the way, I am looking forward to this luncheon this afternoon to be able to, a couple of hours to speak with pastors that are here. Um, I mentioned last night, I've been in ministry 47 years. My first 14 years, I was um, Baptist. I... Uh, Oh, grew up in a general Baptist home, which is Arminian, which is not Calvinist, the opposite of Calvinism. I uh, went to a, a general Baptist college, majored and minor, took all my electives in <laughs> religious studies because I wasn't going to go on to seminary. This, the school was so liberal by the time I graduated, I didn't believe enough to stay in the ministry, and I knew it. So I went to the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary because it was the only one I could afford. I wanted to go to Asbury, but it was too expensive, and because I spoke in tongues, they wouldn't let you in. Uh, <laughs> Now they have professors that speak in tongues, like Craig Keener, Dr. Craig Keener and others. It's amazing things and how things are changing. Um, so by the time I graduated from the, with my Master of Divinity at 25, um, I had taken a, a, the few conservative professors I could find and would play the devil's advocate and hoping they would destroy the arguments that I got at the bachelor's level. Um, and to be honest, I really... It, what it was was testimonies and the experience that um, was really helpful in, in bringing me to the place that at 32 I would leave the Baptist denomination and join the vineyard. And then in, in 2001 at 
49, I uh, resigned my church I'd started and moved to Pennsylvania and uh, just gave full time to the ministry that we now have, which is um, going all over the world and teaching and working with pastors, particularly in all denominations. Um, but one of the things that happened was discovering that there really was more and watching those gifts in operation. And uh, I had read things, but seeing God do something is different from reading about God doing something. Uh, that's so much so that in the, uh, the books I'm now writing, the new books that's coming out next year, I actually have URLs in them. Now, I tell a story and say, would you like to see that? If you'd like to see that person give their testimony, here, you go online, here, here's where you can find it. All, all of them in one place kind of gathered for each book. And because uh, I just think it's, it's um, we now have four, but it's very hard to find testimonies uh, when they're happening because we have one camera and we often have 80 to 100 people that are praying. How can the camera guy be at the right place at the right time to capture the one while it's happening? And it's very hard. And so we only had two like that, and, but this last trip to Brazil, our camera guy, he must have had a gift of discernment because he literally caught two healings as they were happening on one night after all these years. So now we have uh, four, not the, not the testimonies, but the testimony of them being healed. Just, you know, I mean, the video of them watching them as it happens. And so that's really exciting. Um, so I want to change the subject. I need to, start, need to get started. We, first message is called Thrill of Victory, and we'll follow it up by the agony of defeat. Uh, I was on my way down to Santiago, Chile, and I was um, going to work with Morse Cirillo and Cindy Jacobs and some other people down there. And uh, I felt like the, the, I was asking the Lord. I said, uh, Lord, how can I explain to people who haven't been involved in healing that are wanting to start what the healing ministry is like. And I had this picture of, um, it just came into my head, and I really think it was the Lord of uh, ABC, uh, the first sports uh, show on television. And it was ABC Wide World of Sports. Many of you may remember that the announcer would come on and he would say, ABC Wide World of Sports, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. And when he'd say the thrill of victory, you saw somebody r breaking the ribbon, winning the race. And when he said the agony of defeat, you saw this person on his really high ski jump crashing. And, he's, and I felt like the Lord said, that's it. <laughs> that is the healing ministry. If you will give yourself to it, you will have thrills of victory. But you'll also have agonies of defeat. And if you're not willing to embrace the agony of defeat, you will not survive to continue for your next thrill of victory. So much so that at the end, uh, actually when I first started teaching this, I, this message was one message and it was called God Can Use Little O' Me. And uh, the introduction was about the agony part, but it grew up and became its own sermon. Um, but I would like for you to say it because here's my point I want to make. I only have one purpose in both of these messages, and that would be that you would believe God can use you, and you'd be willing to pay the price to be used. Because I believe the main reason why more people who are Christians and who believe in healing don't pray for healing is the emotional price tag associated with this ministry that I'll talk about in the second message. And so at the end, we want to have a time for just prayer, for God to fill you with so much love that his love would be the motivation for you to continue even when power doesn't seem to be happening. Because there are times even, it's recorded in Luke 5, 17, and the Spirit of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. Um, you know, he said, I can only do what I see the Father doing. So... Um, I want to give you five principles that are true and then I'm going to come back and do something that's not normally done in homiletics or in preaching. 
Uh, they teach you in school that you give your point and then you give your illustrations and your illustrations support your point. My illustrations will all contradict my points. <laughs> and, the, and, and I actually know I'm doing it. I'm not so stupid that I don't know I'm doing that. I mean, I, I'm aware that my con illustrations are contradicting the points. Because I have five principles or five points that are true and biblical. But they're not to be made into laws. Because if you turn them into laws, you know what the enemy always has done with law? He brings death. Even the good law in the Old Testament, Paul said he brought death through it. When we develop a legalistic attitude toward the law, it brings death. The enemy then beats us up with it. Um, and where I think this is really uh, can be seen is uh, one time I was reading a book by A.T. Pearson, who was a Presbyterian. It was one of the early Pentecostal leaders. He had been a Presbyterian, a Greek scholar in Canada. And he wrote a book on the atonement that, um, uh, I believe it was Kenneth Hagin and one other person, Roy Hicks or someone like I forgot now. But they, re they modernized it. And um, is on his healing in the atonement is what the book was about. And um, it is... In the book that I was reading by Pearson, uh, I was down in Brazil, and I got to the back of the, of the book, and it said, uh, frequently ask questions. Now, this is really interesting, because it shows us a perspective on, on that we are not living in the good old days of Pentecostalism. We're living in the better days of Pentecostalism. Because there's more happening today in the Pentecostal world, charismatic world, than there was in the beginning of the movement in the early 1900s. So this book was written somewhere between in the 20s or 30s. And um, the question was, why aren't everybody healed that we pray for? And he gave reasons. And the early Pentecostal movement had bought hook, line, and sinker the arguments of the faith cure movement, which had been developed by, a, by the Presbyterian um, um, A.B. Simpson, the Dutch Reform, and all these were cessationist denominations. The Dutch Reform, Andrew Murray, who wrote all these great devotional books like, like With Christ in School of Prayer. A.J. Gordon from Boston, a, a, a Baptist who read, uh, his, who read the New Testament in Greek every morning. He was a great scholar. Who B.B. Warfield wrote a whole chapter in his book on uh, uh, counterfeit miracles against uh, Gordon's book. Uh, these were all the leaders, some of the leaders in the faith cure movement. And that was in, from like 1850 um, and particularly 1875, 1900. It was the uh, most controversial subject in the Church of America was healing. And it was introduced into the holiness movement. And then at one point near the end, of the holiness movement before there's 25 new denominations that were started um, in holiness. Um, they said you can't teach on these two subjects because two new subjects was introduced. What were these new subjects? Healing and what was the other one? Pre-trib rapture, never been heard of. The pre-trib rapture view started in 1830 with Margaret MacDonald in Port Glasgow, Scotland and she told uh, David Irving and uh, uh, Edward, was it Edward Irving? I'm trying to think. And, and, uh, and, and it came over and got put in the notes of the Schofield Bible. And so that was so controversial because the Church of America was post-tribulation instead of pre-tribulation uh, was the major view. It was a major view of the Calvinists. It was a major view of Jonathan Edwards. It was the major view pretty much of the whole church. And it took the Civil War uh, and the tragedy and the, all the loss of the Civil War to break the positive attitude in the American psyche to, be, to turn it toward uh, uh, like things are going to get worse instead of get better. Now, the only reason I even mention anything about eschatology or the study of the last things is I finally, because I was ready to let, willing to read a sleep, let a sleeping dog lie, until I realized that that sleeping dog was one of the reasons why many people don't believe in a 
revival in the end times. They believe the church will be a defeated church, a weak church, a layout of sin church based upon a dispensational view. And I realized, oh my gosh, that's why some people say, but they, and instead of saying, uh, believing in what God's doing, say, well, those are lying signs and wonders that Jesus spoke about in Matthew 25. But it's really interesting. It, it's, it, it should be easy to tell when it's a lying sign and wonder because there's a theological test. They deny the incarnation. There's a moral test in the sense of the, 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 the lifestyle, the person teaching. Um, there, and, and, and there's a worship test. And that's the big one because in, in Revelation, when you got the mark of the beast where they're trying to get people not to worship Christ, the whole issue, the whole theological key to understanding the book of Revelation, it's a battle over the worship of people. Will they worship the lamb or will they worship the beast? And so if signs and wonders are taking place through a people that's adamantly focused on the triune God, and worshiping Jesus, and if they believe that Jesus became flesh, and he's God in the flesh, he's the second person of the Trinity that became flesh, and if there's moral, uh, 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 moral uh, good moral ethic in the person that's teaching, then those are three tests that you can tell whether or not someone is uh, one of the ones that's a lying teaching, a lying sign and wonder. Um, but anyway, so... My purpose this morning is this one sentence, you would believe it more after this teaching than you believe it right now. Because I want to take things away that the enemy will beat you up with. Because in the faith cure movement, there were principles. And if you fulfilled the principle, if you fulfill, they call it conditions. If you meet the conditions, God has to move. And that was developed and brought into Pentecostalism because the holiness movement, Pentecostalism, the earliest, the first two or three denominations within Pentecostal all grew out of the holiness movement where the whole holiness denomination now became a, like Pentecostal holiness. <laughs> Obviously, you can see where the roots are. And so... They brought in this new teaching on healing and also the new teaching that was being taught about eschatology, the end of last, the, the, the view of end times. And that's why um, uh, it, is, it was so strong. Um, they, they, those were the two new teachings that was rapidly uh, growing in the United States. So here was the problem. The enemy comes and said, you're not, he says, you're not meeting the condition. One of the conditions that's needed for healing is not being met. And so if you believe we have to meet the conditions before God heals, then if the condition is not being met, logically, where do we go? We think, oh, he's not going to move because we're not meeting the conditions. And what I'd like to, what I'm going to point out is even though I believe these five principles are true, every one of my illustrations is going to contradict it and show you God healed when that condition wasn't being met. Now that doesn't mean we shouldn't strive to meet the conditions because when all the conditions are present, it's actually a e much easier atmosphere in which healing does take place. But to make a law out of those conditions causes us to doubt rather than believe in that context, God's going to move. Does that make sense to you? Okay, so what are these five principles that are true, biblical? I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what they are. I'm going to tell you where they're at in the Scripture. And then I'm going to come back and um, give the illustrations. Uh, when I first got married, um, my wife, her spiritual gift that she has the least of is mercy. And we're both very dominant type, high D people in the sense that's our personality, which means that there's a lot of interesting discussions in my house. <laughs> Many people think we're having an argument when we're just having a discussion because we're so, both of us are strong in our strong-willed people. And, you know, you know it's, if you've never had an argument in your family, you married a very passive mate. <laughs> whichever way it is one's dominant and the other one's passive and you don't ever have an argument <laughs> man if you marry somebody that's just like you and you're both dominant just, anyway so 
I, so I, I, we just got married and, and I'd preached one of my first sermons uh, when she was my wife. And on the way home, we preachers, we fish for compliments. We, 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 we don't want to be so obvious that we just, you know, say, I need a compliment. We, we'll say something like, well, what would you think of the sermon today? And so on the way home, I said to my wife, what would you think of the sermon today, hon? And she said, what was your point? And I said, what do you mean, what was my point? She said, all you did was tell stories. I said, well, uh, the stories carry the point. They are the point. And, you know, if you got the story, you got the point. Said, no, no, no. I need a point. I, I, I need you to tell me what you're going to tell me. I need you to then tell me what you told me you was going to tell me. And then when you get done, tell me what you told me. I need takeaway points. And, and she really, even though she had never taken a homiletics class, that's really what they tell you to do. And, um, and, and I, I said, well... I got defensive. I said, well, I tell you what, you can give me all the points in the world, but if you don't give me a story to back that point up, I will forget it. By the time I leave the sanctuary, before I get to the car, I can't tell you anything the preacher said if he doesn't give me a story. He said, well, that's you. I'm not like you. I need a point. So I just want to say this. You should be glad for it. Because I had this revelation that really scared me one day. I found out, I, I thought she was weird. I found out that half the people of the world are like my wife. And I thought, oh my gosh, half of the, everybody that listens to me needs a point. You should be glad I married her because now I want to give you the five <laughs> principles that are true. But some of them I'm going to give, be able to get... Some really good stories too. <laughs> principle number one, and the most important principle in my opinion, is faith. And there's a whole lot of scripture, Matthew 9, uh, 22. Uh, I'll give you some of these. Uh, Matthew 9, 29. Um, Matthew 21, 21. These are all powerful scriptures that, uh, do you believe that I can do this? Matthew 9, 29. Be it done to you according to your faith. They said yet the blind people. Um, 922, the, the, I believe it was the woman with the issue of blood. Your faith has healed you. Uh, 2121, it deals with faith. It's a very similar to uh, Mark 11, 21 through 24. Uh, Mark 11, 21 through 24 is very important. I'll read it in a moment. And then finally, Hebrews 11, 6, without faith is impossible. Please God. Now, one of the things, though, I learned that faith in, 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 the, in my doctoral level, by the way, my doctoral level of school was the most exciting, the best. It was the most conservative. It was full-on Holy Spirit stuff. It was saying, this is the heart of what Jesus is all about, the, the, you know, coming and being able to give us the Spirit. It wasn't just to get us to heaven. It was to get the power of heaven to us. And it was just so uh, exciting. But I learned one thing about faith in the Scripture is not what we believe so much, though there is that one time, there's a use of faith in that way as what we believe. Faith in the New Testament and in the Old Testament, and if you look, you can see it really in Hebrews 11, that great chapter of faith. Faith in the scripture is rooted in hearing a rhema word from God and then obeying it, stepping out in faith to obey what he told you to do. That is the biblical concept, the most, the, most, uh, the most common understanding of faith is hearing from God. Faith is based in hearing from God and obeying what he's told you to do. And the other aspect of faith is that almost always the enemy will test that word and there will be opposition to the word. And faith is not just hearing initially and obeying, faith is also continuing to obey in the middle of the battle and not quitting. This is an under, uh, this is basically, if you look all the way through the scripture, you'll, you'll see this. So, um, I mentioned this last night in, in Mark chapter 11 in verse, um, 22, most tra English translations has have faith in God. Um, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, if you say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt uh, in his heart, but believes that what he says will happen, it will be done for him. Uh, therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Um, 
And, and by the way, the next passage deals with forgiveness. And I always thought, that's a weird, that last verse just doesn't seem to fit. And then I found out that unforgiveness is probably one of the biggest blocks to healing uh, that, that we've seen. When we get people to work through the forgiveness, often the, the, the healing comes. And so it really does uh, fit in there. Faith can be affected by unforgiveness. Um, so in that verse, have faith in God, F.F. Um, F. Bosworth, who wrote the book Christ the Healer, which is a classic, uh, was the first person I ever read that helped me to see that the, the, the Greek there if you, is, can be translated uh, have faith of God. And, uh, and there's about five English translations I mentioned last night. Passion would be one of the last latest ones to do it that way and I was teaching this in Ukraine and they said that the new it was either Ukrainian or the Russian that's what it says it says have faith of God I was speaking on this in Germany and one of the pastors said our new German uh, Bible the translation we're now using our denomination that's what it has it has have faith of God and so there are other um, uh, languages that also it's translated have faith of God so you say then why are more English translations why does it say have faith in God because it makes more sense if you're a Greek scholar. Have faith in God makes more sense to you than have faith of God. And it's a, it is a, a um, it could be translated either way. But it, more literally, if you look, like at the, the literal translation, it, it, it actually says have faith of God. Um, well, then why wasn't it translated have faith of God? Because if you're a Greek scholar, most Greek scholars have never prayed for the sick. Most Greek scholars are not healing evangelists. Most Greek scholars have not had a ministry of healing. So the faith of God doesn't make sense to them because they have never experienced the faith of God. I mentioned last night in... Uh, 1 Corinthians 13, 2 is the only other place other than, uh, I believe it's Matthew 17 something, um, where it says, you can speak to this mountain to be uprooted and thrown into the sea. And there, it's obviously not your ability to have faith in God, but it's the faith of God, the gift of faith that's being referenced in that place. Every time... I've had a gift of faith. I had absolutely no doubt, none, zero doubt that what I was about to say was going to happen. I have not had that gift as much as I would like. But when I've had it, I sure know the difference between I'm, when it's the faith of God that he has given me and when it's my ability to attain a level of faith. There is a difference. So anyway... So that, that's the first one. Now, the second uh, p- principle is sin in their life. And that's Mark chapter 2, verse 5b, where man's coming down to the roof. His four friends are letting him down to the roof. And Jesus says, uh, um, my son, your sins are forgiven. And, and that's the place where we see that he forgave sins before he healed. Now, I can't prove this, but I do know based upon just medical science, that there are certain levels where guilt is so strong that the guilt is causing the physiological problem. It can be blindness. It can be deafness. It can be paralysis where you can't walk. When there actually is nothing wrong with your eyes, your ears, or your legs. And it's rooted in this deep sense of guilt. And all I'm saying is perhaps this is an illustration of that reality in the New Testament. Um, and you say, well, don't, are you trying to take away? No, Jesus did so many other healings of, of conditions of, of blindness and deafness and everything that was organic that I just wanted, want us to know that, that there really is hope in Jesus and in forgiveness of sin that people who have this type of a problem because... That has to be healed, and sometimes I've seen it easier to, for God, not for God, but for me to minister and see God heal other problems than it is when it's related to this sense of great guilt if I can't get them to move into grace, if 
I can't get them to understand grace in their life. And so this is a reality. I believe there are times, especially if it's a believer who is in rebellion against God, that their own need of forgiveness, their sin, and the guilt that comes from it in the sense of I'm not worthy to receive, which is true. And God is wanting them to confess their sin. But having said that, I never make a law out of it because uh, I remember when I went to India one time, people said, don't pray for healing for any Hindus or Muslims until they accept Jesus and they've been forgiven of their sin. Then you can pray for them. Well, I didn't do that. I'm so glad we didn't because that one time, we, we, in one night, we had 100,000 people there. 50,000 got healed. 30,000 accepted Jesus after they were healed. So I believe the goodness of God is meant to bring us to repentance. And I, I always feel a little uncomfortable when it feels like we're negotiating. We give your life to God so that you can receive healing. I, I don't know if how genuine that's going to be. It's almost like brokering the, the grace of God. I, I think let's just freely give the grace of God. And if they get healed, and often I see people get healed, lost people. You won't have any faith for people who are not saved to get healed if you have that condition. But if you don't have that condition, you can believe God can heal a Muslim, a Hindu, a Sikh, a New Ager, someone totally lost and, you know, their only religion is the bar. <laughs> but you can believe God can heal them. And then bring them to the Lord. Um, so I, I do believe that there is truth here. But if we make it, because often I hear it said, you didn't get healed because you either didn't have enough faith or you have sin in your life. I've had people, my executive director, a former uh, and vice president, he's had people come up to me and said, my pastor told me that I've not been healed because I must have some secret sin in my life, but I have fasted and I have prayed and I've asked God to show me what it is because I do want to ask forgiveness of anything I've done wrong, but I, 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 I don't know what it is. I just don't think that's healthy. And people are searching sometimes. You know, here's what I think. When I discipline my children, they don't have to wonder, wonder what I'm in trouble for. Because the part of discipline is to, to correct. It's, it's not to uh, punish so much as it is to bring correction. And you want to correct and you want them to know what's wrong. And so I really believe that when there is rebellious, rebellion or sin in your life, if we ask God, search our heart and bring it to our mind and show us what it is, he will. That's what he's supposed to do. Don't make a law out of it. Number three, the anointed person. Uh, what I mean by that is there are some people that are really more anointed for healing than others. There are some people that's more anointed to lead worship than others. There are some people more anointed to lead people to Jesus than others. We call them evangelists. We call the others worship leaders. And in the body of Christ, we need each other. And everybody should be a worshiper, but not everybody should be up here leading worship. It would be horrible if they were, some were. I'm one of them <laughs> as a worship leader. I can't, can't keep rhythm. Um, so the anointed person in this context I'm talking about is uh, what Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verse 28 through 31. He asked the rhetorical questions, are all apostles? And these questions demand the answer no. It's not a, I need some information here. His, these are particular types of questions that actually demand the answer no. Are all apostles? No. Are all prophets? No. Do all work miracles or have gifts of healing? 
No. Not everybody's going to be a miracle worker. Not everybody's going to have gifts of healing. Though you may experience gifts of healing, there's a difference between being noted as the, a miracle worker, a healer, a worshiper, an evangelist, a prophet, an apostle. You may have prophecies but not be a prophet. It's the same way with healing. And I believe that there are times in our meetings that we have people, and I not just believe, I know this, I got so many, so I have three books and, and, and just full of people like you who are in a meeting like this and got so touched that they did not have gifts of healing before. And after the meeting, they moved in gifts of healings. And people recognize the change in them. In the sense of the... the does that happen to 100% of the people who come to meetings like this? No, it doesn't. Does it happen to maybe 10%? Maybe. So it's, it's not like I'm, I'm saying, hey, all we have to do is lay hands on you, pray for you, and you're going to get a gift of healing. I don't believe that. And, and that's why I really say, don't come up to me and ask, why won't you lay hands on me and, and pray for me? I, I, we will to this afternoon, but you have to know something. What happens this afternoon is a sovereign thing. I, I have a role. I have a role. My role is, is to build hunger and to build faith for God to touch you. And there will be an increase. I believe that every one of you can have an increase, but not every one of you are going to step into what I believe is the continuation of the gift of healing or workers of miracles. Now, the cessation of Churches don't believe that that's possible. They don't believe those two gifts exist. I don't have time to go into why, but I, I, I'm tempted to, but I won't shoot that. <laughs> that rabbit was about to get out, and I was about to chase it, but I shot the thing, so I'm not, I'm not going to chase that one. Um, but it needs to be noted that in the New Testament, it's not just the apostles who heal. Um, Paul in Galatians 3, I think 15 or 3, 5, I forget now. He said, uh, do you, did you work miracles through the uh, law or through faith? Through the keeping of the law or through faith? The miracles that was taken. Now, that was to the church. Paul was no longer there. It's, it's one of those things that the miracles were done by lay people too. Not just the clergy, not just people in fivefold offices. Miracles was done in the New Testament by lay people. One of the biggest evidences of that is um, Acts uh, 11, I think it's 17. And they talked about those who were scattered, uh, you know, where they went. These were, and the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. So those that were scattered are not the apostles. And it, and it says, and the hand of the Lord was upon them. Now this word, hand of the Lord, means the miracle working power of God. All the way through the Old Testament, the hand of the Lord is a, a Jewish euphemism for the power of God. And so, it's, it, and we know that the church at Antioch, was founded by those people who were scattered who were not apostles. And this is why we need to believe that I don't have to be a pastor. I don't have to be an evangelist. I don't have to be an apostle. I don't have to be a prophet for God's gift of healing to come upon me. I'll, I'll talk about that in the afternoon session and give you an illustration of it. So... Um, the anointed person, there's a passage that proves that there are people who are anointed and who have modern day gifts of healing. It's also significant to note that Paul makes the distinction between the apostle who worked miracles and those who worked miracles who were not apostles. Because he mentions are all apostles, all prophets, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healings, do all speak in tongues. And, and so we see... Um, a scripture for this principle that there are people who have gifts of healing by the grace of God. Um, and then another a principle is feeling the anointing. G um, Jesus 
When he prayed for the woman with the issue of blood, he felt the anointing flow out of him. And um, Colossians 1.29, Paul said, we labor with all his energy that works so mightily within us. He used, it's the word energy, it's often translated working in, in uh, English, but it, it's the word from which we do get the word energy. And I refuse to give that word up to the New Agers because we had it first. Amen. You know, the energy of God, the reality, people often, I feel they like this, often the two most common signs when people get healed, and sometimes people don't feel anything, but they're healed. They don't know until they try. That's why I say try to do what you can't because sometimes people don't know they're healed until they try because they felt absolutely nothing. But more commonly, people feel heat or energy, uh, like electricity, flowing through their body right before they're healed. Um, as a matter of fact, one time I did a study and everybody that was healed of metal in their body felt heat before they were healed in this one uh, meeting. And by the way, that's what I wrote my doctoral dissertation on. I studied the effects of Christian prayer upon chronic pain and loss of range of motion from surgically implanted material was my dissertation. Wow. And I uh, studied it for a year, and over 900 people were in the study. And, and you know, we compared it with, uh, oh, anyway. Can't go there. <laughs> Boom! That's a big one. That's a kangaroo about to get loose. <laughs> And then number five, compassion, mood of compassion, Jesus healed the sick. Very quickly, I'd like to say I think the most two important of all these principles is number one is the most important is going to be faith. And the second most important is going to be compassion, moved by the God's love. All of them are important and all of them are biblical. But if we turn these principles into law, there's going to be times that we would not expect God to move. And what I want... In this same, same, you got five points. I actually don't have five points. Those are just five illustrations of one point. And here's the only point I'm going for this morning. Stand on the rug of peace, Wimber taught me, and don't step off of it when you pray for sick. Now, I under, it's come to me, my understanding, this rug of peace is the rug of grace. And when you step out of grace into works, into law, you can become anxious and you can't rest in peace because it's more upon you now than it is upon him. One of the best books I think that's ever been written, though I think he was too hard upon the faith cure movement, was by an English guy who came to Canada. He was a liberal Methodist and he got healed in an Amy Simple McPherson meeting and turned his views, and he became actually a famous healing evangelist named Dr. Charles Price. His book that's free on the internet, The Real Faith, I think is one of the best books that talks about faith I've ever read. Having said that, I do think there's times he's just a little too hard on the faith cure movement, um, and, uh, but I think it's, it, there's a great, great truth um, in, in what he is writing. And his main emphasis is this grace that produces miracles. And I would agree 100%. I have never seen a miracle that wasn't preceded by the gift of God's faith. I've seen healings based upon the faith of the person, faith of the person praying, the level of, ex their measure of faith. I've seen healings take place, but I've never seen a miracle take place that wasn't preceded by a gift of faith. So now, let's, let's, let's begin. Wow. I was um, in Florida, and this guy, I prayed for him. He was a word of faith pastor, had a healing school in his church. And uh, he was very famous because he's a great athlete in the high school there, and he still held records and all. He was a, a, a football pro football uh, draft type person uh, but he was, he was now uh, in the ministry or had been and had grown a church in six years from zero to 600 and as a word of faith church and he was a, a deeply committed and he was hurt really really bad and he had three uh, fusions in his neck 
uh, from hundreds of pounds. When the machine broke, came down across his neck, uh, and uh, just there was nothing they could do for him. They wanted to do a fourth fusion. He had been in, for, like the worst migraine headache you could ever have, 24/7. As long as he was awake, he was in pain. He had been taking uh, very powerful. Um, prescription drugs to try to deal with the pain and it wasn't dealing with it the doctor was afraid he's going to get addicted to opioids and stuff so they had to back off and he met with me because he said I want to talk to you and I prayed for him before I talked to him I prayed for him the night before and absolutely nothing had happened and uh, he met with me in the morning and he said you know I, I, I can't believe anymore should I just accept this is the way I'm going to be because he's, I'm, I am in so much pain. I'm a miserable man. I'm in so much pain. I'm on edge. My nerves are shot. I'm in so much pain. I can't do anything with my kids anymore. My kids have lost their dad for six years. I'm in so much pain. I, I, I yell at my wife. I'm in so much pain. I, I, he, he told me some other things he was doing. So anyway, he said, should I just accept this? And I'm a, I was at the time a vineyard pastor, and he's the word of faith guy. And I said, no, you don't accept it. Because where else can you go? The doctors can't do anything for you. And so God understands if you don't want to get prayed for every time. But if there's ever anything that gives you encouragement, just, just continue to go for it. And so, but he told me, he said, I, I know I'm saying I, I'm making the right confession. But I know in my heart that my head no longer believes what my, or my heart no longer believes what my head's saying. Or my head doesn't even believe what my mouth is saying. Because I have been prayed for by some of the most famous people, and I've not been healed. I've been prayed for, and I've been believing for my healing for six years, and I've not been healed. And so that night, the next night after that, I mean, the, the, that night after that morning, he came up to me and said, I want you to pray for me. And I'm thinking, boy, I wish you hadn't talked to me this morning. <laughs> I, I, I was actually thinking, because I, I was thinking, I prayed for you last night, and nothing happened. I was thinking, hoping maybe you could have some faith. Because God could heal you on your faith. I know I don't have hardly any for you because I prayed for you. And then he told me you didn't have any faith <laughs> this morning. And so I, I in, in my Bible, right here, that's the biggest mustard seed I could find so you could see it. Most of the time you can't see them because, you know, they're just too little. Um, but that's a really good, I like that about the mustard seed. Because um, he didn't, well, anyway. And... I had a mustard seed. And I started to pray for him. Now, he had, he couldn't turn it, he couldn't, he could not because his three fusions. He couldn't look up and see the stars. He couldn't look down and see his shoes. He couldn't look to the right or the left. And when he moved, this is the range of motion he had. And when he did this, you could hear the scrunching. It was bad. And uh, so when he asked me to pray for him, I'll tell you. Number one principle, I don't have it. I'm disqualified by law because I know I don't have faith for him to be healed. And what's worse, I know he doesn't have any. So I'm thinking this is one of those conditions that definitely is not being met. And if I would turned it into a law, I would, would have not, there's no need to pray. But I had a little bit of mustard seed. But then here's what God did. That morning... I remembered that, at, that, that night, that that morning I had awakened with a vision, a mental picture, not an open vision, but a mental picture, or could have been a dream, I don't, um, of arrows, like Excedrin headache, arrows going into the bicep. So I said, his name was my name, his name was Randy. I said, Randy, do you have a problem in your left bicep? He says, yes, I, I have a pinched nerve. Going down in my left bicep, it just kills me. I said, you didn't tell me that, did you? He said, no, I didn't tell you that. I said, okay, I had this vision. I want to, I, I don't want, I'm going to pray for your neck, but I want to pray for your arm. Let's pray for your arm. That's where I had faith. But it wasn't my faith. God created that faith. Because once he said, yes, I have that, I realized, oh, oh, God showed me that. Now I know he wants to do this. So I started praying for him. And he said, it's getting hot. I said, that's good. And my faith growing and, and, and he said it's gone all, all, all the pains first time in six years i don't have shooting pain in my bicep my face went <laughs> and I, now now i'm ready to start praying for the headache 
you know, and I start praying. He said, oh, I got electricity in my head. And I think, <laughs> I keep praying. I got heat all over my head. <laughs> he said, my headache is gone for the first time in six years. I don't have that headache. Now, God took a man who had so little, but understanding his ways, understanding his ways gave me an insight into his will. He's going to do this tonight. And so understanding his ways, what God did created the faith. And now you would have thought I graduated from Raymond myself. Because <laughs> I said, I call those things that are not as though they were. I speak to those vertebrae and those discs and I speak healing in Jesus' name. And, and, and Randy goes, <laughs> and I know that's impossible. It, it, anatomically, it's impossible for him to do that. And, and he, now he can look down and see his shoes. I mean, he's healed. I'm jumping up and twist, spinning. I'm jumping, spinning, and jumping, spinning. Found out later that's the Hebrew word for praise, jump and spin. It literally means, literally does. It means jump and spin. I think as people saw, people responded to God's miracles by getting so excited, they jump and spin. And they, 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 that's a word for praise, jump and spin, jump and spin. <laughs> Then somebody prophesied, Dr. Uh, Randy Ostrander, when you go back to John Hopkins University, they're going to do an MRI and they'll find no change. But I have healed you and I'm telling you in advance. So we went back to John Hopkins University. And they did the MRI and they brought him in and they said, Mr. Ostrander, we're sorry to tell you, but there's no improvement. Your MRI looks just like it did. And then he looked at the doctor and said, how do you explain this? <laughs> he said, you know, you know, you don't understand. You can't do that. There's no way you can do that. It's, it's impossible. It's anatomically impossible for you to do that. That's why Jesus said, "Don't change. you got to change the way you think. Because what's impossible to man is possible for God. All things are possible uh, for God. Now, why he doesn't... And, and by the way, the last time I saw him, uh, we were together on jet skis out in the... Uh, the uh, the riverways running into the ocean there in Florida and he was just you know and he actually the government kept him on total disability because he's got the evidence and he started using those government checks to start back into ministry and he has a uh, he, he, now he has a ministry for restoring ministers that's burned out but he didn't meet the conditions he didn't have faith he even confessed he didn't have faith that morning. Now, why he had to wait six years? Hey, that's above my pay grade. Why I had to wait 90 days before my healing came for the one of the three times. I ended up with nine herniated discs and <laughs> three injuries. Um, one of them, I'm facing surgery. And a guy, after 90 days, of an hour of physical therapy, six days a week, 90 days of two epidurals, next thing is surgery, back surgery, a man has an open vision of me in a little country church down in Louisiana, and I was in Pennsylvania, and he sees my spine, and he sees the disc and the vertebra and the nerves running out of it, and he sees the, the, herniated, the herniated disc, and he sees the pinched nerves, and he hears a voice telling to push the stuff that squirted out of my disc, push it back into the disc, and he's acting that out in this vision, in this little church, and he said, people must have thought I was crazy. But when I woke up the next morning, I had not been able to walk without crutches for 90 days. And I accidentally touched my foot to the floor and it didn't hurt. I got up and I walked. It didn't hurt. I went up and downstairs normally. It didn't hurt. I yelled at my wife, I've been healed, but I have no idea how it happened. <laughs> because I'd had Heidi Baker and Bill Johnson and, and uh, you name it. I had a lot of those people come and pray for me in person, or over the phone. I had people from all over during those nine days pray for me. I didn't get healed. The guy who prayed for me was a businessman. Amen. The guy who had that vision was a layman, a businessman. And God used him. Now, you can say, well, that's just power of suggestion. The only problem with that is I did not know who and how God had done it for five hours after I was healed, I get an email from him where he's telling me about his experience. And I called him immediately and said, that was God. 
Here's what's so wonderful. How much faith did I exercise in getting my healing while I was asleep? I got healed in my sleep. Now, having said it, that man, that layman, he exercised faith because he did exactly what the Lord told him to do in that vision. He, d- he didn't worry about what anybody else thought. He acted it out. Sometimes people get healed. It's on the faith of the person that's praying for them, even when they may be dead. How much faith did Lazarus have? Or they may be asleep. Or they may at a distance. Let me give you one more story about that. And by the way, I'm, I really just figured this out. I'm not going to be able to do both of these sermons in this time because I'd like to go a little more longer into this one and then we'll, we'll hit on another one another time. Um, there's a, a, a nephew. I was at Bill's church in Reading and one of the words of knowledge was for um, an ankle that had been all messed up. The nephew knows his, uh, by the way, I've met the woman and I've seen her x-rays. I saw her another time in Canada. This word of knowledge is for, I think it was the right ankle, all, in, all messed up. She has a severe injury with all types of metal in her ankle. It's been reconstructed and she is uh, on crutches and it's just going to be a long time before she's going to be able to, to walk normal and she's going to have problems for the rest of her life is the prognosis. And um, the nephew hears this word. And he says, that's for my aunt. And texted her in this message. I believe this word is for you. And I believe God's going to heal you. But she's asleep when he texted to her. Because it was, after, it was late at night when this happened. She woke up. And I got out of bed. I, think she, I don't know if she's going to the restroom in the middle of the night or whatever. But anyway, she's, she's walking and realizes halfway to the restroom... I don't have my crutches. And I don't have any pain. She was totally healed. While she's asleep, she got healed, I believe, because of the nephew who understood that's for my aunt. And it was what God was using him. When we believe that the person has to have enough faith to be healed, we often don't have faith if we're praying for somebody and we know they don't have faith because we feel like we're not meeting the conditions. And what I'd like to say is as important as those conditions are, and it's always easier when there's more faith and when there's less faith, there's still this grace of God that can break into what seems to be a hopeless situation and bring about healing. And I don't understand why this one and not that one. I don't understand why my executive director, former executive director, now vice president, Tom Jones, I don't understand why he stood praying for a woman who has exactly his condition and he's facing his fourth surgery, back surgery right now. He has metal in his back. But before he ever had his first surgery, he's waiting for a year, trying to believe God for his healing until the, the spinal cord is the size of a quarter and perfectly round. His got down to about that big right there. He almost, well, he did. He waited too long, actually, and got some permanent damage. When he finally had the surgery, because he's put it off wanting to wait to be healed. I don't understand why he didn't get healed. He, he, he did everything. He really was expectant. He's pushed off as long as possible. Every time there's a word for healing in the back, he'd stand up and do things. And then one day a woman is standing in front of him who's got exactly his condition, spondylosis and stenosis, stenosis particularly. Um, and she's in pain. She's actually got tears coming down her face because she's in so much pain every waking moment. He prays. He's got the same thing. She got healed. But he wasn't healed. Those types of questions I don't have answers for. I don't know. I don't believe it was because he didn't have enough faith and she did. I actually don't believe that because I've seen God heal people who I knew had less faith than some people who didn't get healed. 
And so we can try to have an atmosphere and we honor faith and we, we try to help people come into faith, but we don't, we, we don't want to make a conclusion if you didn't get healed, it's your fault. And then put a heavier burden on them. By the way, if you're counseling someone who's not getting healed, to tell them they don't have enough faith is to agree with Satan wow. instead of the Holy Spirit. Now, what do I mean by that? Satan's the accuser of the brethren. The Holy Spirit comes along beside you as the, com the comforter, the counselor, the guy. I don't know why we never call him the empowerer because he, uh, he's that too. It's a word that means the one who comes to you to help you with what you need at that time. That's why it's translated so many different words. Parakletos is translated so many different ways. He comes to strengthen us and help us. Comes as advocate rather than state's attorney. He comes to defend rather than accuse. So when we're getting ready to... Because here's the other thing. If it's true, someone doesn't have enough faith. And you tell them that you're not getting healed because you don't have enough faith. What does that do to them? It reinforces their understanding. I'm not going to get healed because I don't have enough faith. And it doesn't help their faith. It actually brings a condemnation. Even if it's true, this is a problem. This could be a major reason. It doesn't, do, it doesn't help to give that answer. What we should do is try and build their faith. Give them some scriptures to memorize. Begin to tell them stories. Tell them where there's some videos of someone that got healed of what they have. What we want to do instead of accusing is help them come into more faith. Does that make sense? Okay. So, Ann Harrison, I was doing a meeting in uh, Tennessee and this woman came up to me and I didn't want him to pray for her because I was praying for impartation for people under 30 years old to go to the mission field, be pastors, missionaries. And I'm praying for that. And I said, this is the only night I'm not going to pray for healing, but my team will up in the balcony. But don't come to me for healing because I'm going to be praying for impartation. And this woman came and she's shaking really bad. She had Parkinson's. I didn't know she had Parkinson's when she was shaking. I, you know, a lot of people were shaking in that time and it was Holy Spirit and I you know she said I want you to pray for me and I said no 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 I'm not praying for people tonight going up to the, I already been to the balcony and they prayed for me I didn't get healed and then she said but God told me if you'd pray for me he'd heal me now some a lot of people say that some people heard from God and some people thought it and uh, and I, I I didn't really think it was the Lord I thought it was just her but sometimes rather than arguing, it's easier to just pray real quick. You know, Lord, I bless you in Jesus' name. Be healed and go on. So rather than have a discussion about why you don't want to pray for them. And so, but she's telling me that all this stuff that's wrong with her, she can't. And she told me she had Parkinson's then. And she told me that she hadn't held her two-year-old son, grandson. And uh, uh, she didn't have any short-term memory. And she's losing control of her bladder and her bowel. She had peed all over herself. At, standing in line at Kroger store, holding on to her husband's arm because she can't walk without him anymore. And she says, I don't want to live like this. I, I, I'd just rather die than continue to live like this. I need to be in a nursing home. We can't even afford it. And they're spending $280-some-odd a month on medicine back in 95. And, uh, and so I, I have to be honest with you. I really didn't have faith God's going to heal her. I was just trying to accommodate so I could go pray over here. And so I lift up my hand and I started to say, come Holy Spirit. But I got, I got come hold and I didn't even get the Lee out. And she hit the floor. And she stopped shaking. And, and uh, uh, I went ahead and I'm over here and I'm praying for a bunch of people. But now she's got my curiosity. <laughs> and, and her husband's name was Elvis. So I went over and, and, and they were from Tennessee. And, uh, and I, I went over to Elvis and I said, Elvis, you know, is that, is that normal? She's not shaking. She's no, the only time she doesn't shake is when she's in a deep sleep. Like, okay, deep sleep's a lot like being slain in the spirit, perhaps. And maybe that's what's going on. And then I was on the 23rd day of uh, a 40-day fast because of the stories that I w was going to tell you in the agony of defeat. 
that all happened in six months. All these kids and teenagers that didn't need to be healed, they needed creative miracles. And I, I've seen so many more healings than creative miracles. And it was breaking my heart. It was so uh, difficult. I, I would go, I'd cry myself sometimes to sleep, not to sleep, but I'd cry before I go to sleep in the, ho- in the, in the hotel uh, thinking, God, this is hard. It just all those kids and that young bride and with the big hole in her head and the t- tumor and, and those the little girl is blind and the, the little the little boy in the wheelchair and his sister had CP and he had uh, 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 spinal bifida and, and and all within six months I have all these experiences and as a result of it I I went on a um, it was the it was the last forty day fast I've only done two and it was the last one. And I didn't do one day of fasting between the first two, first 40 day and the second 40 day. So I don't want you to think I'm more than I am. Uh, and so it's the 23rd day of this 40 day fast for miracles. And I asked Elvis, I don't understand, what's Parkinson? He explained, it destroys brain cells. And he said, destroys brain cells. And he just said, oh, she doesn't need a healing. She needs a creative miracle. He said, yes, that's right. And what had happened for God to create the situation, my worship leader and his wife were with me, and his wife had said, I'm tired of hearing you and Gary talk about all these healings. I want to see one. And she was weeping. The Holy Spirit on the way there in the van had come on her, and she's weeping. She had no idea why she was weeping. I had no idea why she was weeping. Later, I understood it was an intercession gift that had come upon her. And I kneeled down, and I realized we're about to see a miracle. And I said, Annie, get over here. We're about to see one. <laughs> and I put my hand on her head, and I began to pray. I said, God, I ask you, and I got the number wrong because I think he says 800 million brain cells had been destroyed. I said, God, I ask you for 500 million. No, wrong number. Lord, I need 800, 800 new million new brain cells. I call that which is not as though it was in the name of, were in the name of Jesus. And she started screaming and squirming on the floor. And she's going, ah, ah, oh, my head, my head, ah, stop it, stop it, stop it. It hurts my head. It's killing me. Stop the praying. Now, they didn't teach me in Bible school or seminary what to do in a situation like that. So I, uh, I got a word of wisdom. I prayed. God, don't listen to her prayer. Listen to mine. More, more, more. And then she just went perfectly still. I got down on my knees and whispered in her ear. Her name was Ann Harrison. I whispered in her ear, Ann, what's happening? She says, and there's a lot of noise going, lots of people praying everywhere, people praying, people, music going in the background. It's loud. She says, I don't hear anything. All I know is that you're here, Jesus is here, and Elvis is here. <laughs> and then she put her hand up like that. She's looking at her hand. I know she's looking at her hand, not shake. And then she started doing this. I had no idea on her while she's laying down. While she's lying there, she's doing this. And I had no idea. And Elvis said, you know what she's doing? I said, no, what is she doing? And he said, that's a test for Parkinson. She's not been able to do that for years. And then she got up on her elbow and said, Elvis, get me a drink of water. So he came in with a cup of water. She drank it. And he gets excited. She gets excited. And I'm thinking, what's the big deal? And Elvis knew I wasn't appreciating. And he said, Randy, Anne had lost the ability to swallow from a cup. She could only sip through a straw. Then she got up on her feet. She said, can I go up on the platform? I said, sure. God healed her, queen for a day, do whatever she wants. She came up on the platform. <laughs> she shook her husband's hand. Look at this, I'm squeezing my husband's hand. She stomped her foot. She came out to the edge. She said, people, I haven't been able to hold my two-year-old grandson ever because I shake so bad. I'm going to hold, I'm going to hold my grandson. I've been spending $280 a month. Just think what Elvis and I are going to do with that money. <laughs> and then she looked at me and she said, do you have a piano? And I said, no, nope, but we got a keyboard. Can I play it? I have no idea if she could play it or not. But I said, queen for a day, sure. You know, do whatever you want. 
And she walked over to the keyboard, and I followed her, and Elvis followed me. And good. And she starts playing, and she's really good. I mean, she's really, really, really good. And she's crying, and she's playing. And Elvis is crying. And Elvis, as Paul Harvey said, told me the rest of the story. He said, you don't understand, Randy. Seven years ago, he said, you know, I'm a singer. I said, I thought so. And, <laughs> and she would accompany me on the piano. And one night, seven years ago, in front of about 700 people, she stopped in the middle of the song I was singing. She could not think of a chord. She could not think of a note. She was so humiliated, she ran out the side door. And the next week, we found out she had Parkinson's. And she has not touched a keyboard since that night, seven years ago. And she's playing really, really well. And then she gets so excited about having been healed that she actually tried to get into his gift, which wasn't hers, (laughs) singing. And off key, but nobody cared. Everybody was crying. It was watching this take place. It happened at midnight, by the way. She began to sing. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. And oh, the joy that floods my soul. For something happened. And now I know he's touched me and made me whole. It was an amazing night. It was the worst, that was the worst meeting those three days there or four of the whole year for me until that happened. And it turned the worst meeting into the best meeting. Of the whole year. Because God had showed up. And I didn't even want to pray for her. I didn't meet the condition. I didn't, I didn't meet the com- 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 compassion. <laughs> Talk about sin in their life. And. Let's put this together. Let's talk about sin in their life. And the anointed person. And I'm going to cut out about four illustrations. When I started the church in St. Louis, I like to take, I like, we love to minister to the poor. That is one of the key values of our church. Let's minister to the poor, to the broken. And uh, we would take food into the projects downtown uh, uh, that have been destroyed now. But, you know, the federal projects. We would take food there. And, and we wouldn't, would not let the kids take it up to their parents. We said, no, we'll take it. And so we, as teams, would go up into the projects and take the food so that we got a chance to talk to the parents, usually it's just the mother, and ask them, what do you need? Is there anything we can pray for? And even and, and physical things as well. Here's what I found out. We saw more healing when we were taking food to the poor than we did anywhere else. We saw more healings amongst people who didn't know Jesus but were broken. We didn't make a condition that they got to get saved before they could be healed. We just took the kingdom and believed that God can take his goodness and bring them to repentance. And so this woman, she was a Caucasian woman. We had, to, there was an area of very, very poor um, in South area and uh, I knew she didn't go to church because I asked the the food bank we got our food from to give me the people on their registration that had no church because we wanted a chance to talk to them about Jesus and um, um, and and so I went and I'm talking to her and I knew she didn't have a church and I found out about her history and I found out that she had been christened as a Lutheran Taken as a baby, christened, and that was the last time she'd ever been to church. She didn't know anything about God, and the only prayer she knew was, now I lay me down to sleep, and she didn't know how to finish it. 
she had, I found out that she had been living with a man, and she had already had two, diff, two daughters, one was uh, seven and, no, five and seven years old. Two daughters, five and seven years old, and she had never married, and she had been living with this guy. But the guy had run off, stole her car, emptied her bank account, and she was facing terminal illness because she had had a, a tumor this big right here, and it metastasized to her breast and down into the organs in her abdomen. And the doctor said, there is no hope. The chemo is not working. Uh, you have a few months to live. You need to make, put things in order. Who is going to raise your daughters? Now, that's the situation I stepped into. Would you agree with me that there might be a little sin in this situation? That, that she's a sinner. <laughs> you know, yes. She was. But I never made that a condition that she has to be forgiven before God will heal her. I said, and, and by the way, I'm dealing with a sin in her life and the anointed person right now. At this time, I could put on, I, I'd seen less than 50 people get healed in my life. I have no reputation for praying for people and seeing them get healed. I believed in healing. I'm praying for healing. I'm going for healing because I, I just believe knock and keep on knocking, seek and keep on seeking, ask and keep on asking, <laughs> and the door will be open. <laughs> now, I have had breakthroughs. I've had breakthroughs as the end of 40-day fast once. I had a breakthrough with hands laid on me with an impartation uh, to, to, uh, and, and began to see a lot more. But in January 95 in Florida and in Charlotte, North Carolina, for no reason that I can think of except the bowl of prayer was finally full. And in the sovereign timing of God, he tipped it over. And I saw more healings in January 95 than I'd seen the preceding 25 years of ministry in one month. Amen. But this was before that. And so, and so I just want to encourage you, don't, you know, there can be impartations, yes. Uh, there can be a response to prayer and fasting, yes. But there's also that just persevering, knocking, seeking, asking, and not giving up that also can open because he said it would. Anyway, um, I'm, I, I, I'm, I asked her, I said, can I pray for you? And she said, yes. So I start putting my hands on her head and she said, what are you doing? I, I, I said, you just told me I could pray for you. She said, well, I didn't think you meant now. I thought you meant you'd pray for me when you leave. So don't, I don't want you to pray for me now. Don't, I don't want you to put your hands on me. Just wait till you go home. Or wait till you go to your church and pray for me. And, and I was very honest with her. I said, you know, I know that works. It's called prayer to distance. I've read about it. But I've never seen it happen when I prayed. That's where I'm not at. That, in my opinion, is Ph.D. level praying for the sick, and I'm in kindergarten. <laughs> so to be real honest with you, I know it can happen, but I don't have any faith for that. But I do have faith that if you let me lay my hands on you and pray for you, you could be healed. Yes. And she said, okay. I said, all right. So I said, would you close your eyes? And she said, no. Now, I don't know if she's afraid some of my friends is going to steal the toaster or whatever. She doesn't have the biggest trust thing right now. And it makes me nervous to look at people if, with their eyes open when I'm praying for them. And it, I was just trying to alleviate my nervous situation. And, and so I, I just moved over to the side and put my hands like this so I don't have to look at her. She can't look at me. And, and, and I started um, praying for her. Now, normally, I tell people, because I do believe this is true, it's easier to receive when you're focused on receiving than it is when you're petitioning. I think it, I've seen it's harder for people to get healed when they're praying for healing than it is than if they will expect the healing. And so in asking God to heal, you're still kind of not focused on the moment. And I, and I, and I, and I found out, like with Word of Faith people, it can be difficult. You're praying for them. I believe it. I believe it. I believe it. I receive it. I receive it. I receive it. I believe it. I receive it. I'm just, I'd like to say, would you just shut up and do it? You know, if you just receive it, don't, you know, just do it. Just, just pay attention. 
Because sometimes don't, don't expect it now to happen in the future. Oh, no, I want you to expect it now. I want you to pay attention to your body because I'm believing it's going to happen now. Or sometimes Pentecostals, they can be... And, you go, and I asked Bill, what do you do? He said, I just take my finger. After two or three times in one of them, I just... <laughs> I said, I say this, so I'm praying for her. She turns her head around and she said, my head's hot. I said, that's good. She said, you're weird. I kept, she said, I got electricity in my head. I said, that's good. She said, you're really weird. I said, that's really, really good. She said, you're really, really weird. And then she starts talking. And I'm thinking, you shouldn't be talking. You should be receiving. And I'm getting nervous. I'm thinking, she needs to, she needs to shut up. She, she needs to just let God do this. And she's, she's getting in the way. And I get this impression. It's a really weird thing for God to say. But anyway, it, this is what came in my head. Don't worry about it. This one's on me. And I know that's an odd thing for, don't worry about it. This one's on me. I, okay, I don't worry about it. And every time we went, went like three or four times every two weeks and prayed for her, that happened every time Then I didn't see her anymore because another man moved in. Years later, I saw her. She only had a few months to live. Years later, I saw her at the food bank. I got so excited. You know, I understand you're not supposed to yell at people in public. I know that's bad manners. But she was supposed to be dead. And when I saw her, I, I just, I lost it. I said, Terry, you're alive. I mean, she's like from here to that woman that's standing there with the coffee in the back. I mean, it was really good ways away. And she ran over to me and she said, you embarrass me. You're not supposed to yell at people in public. I know, I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but you're supposed to be dead. <laughs> and you're not. What happened? She said, you know, what's the weirdest thing. After you guys prayed, my head got hot and all that electricity and stuff happened every time. I was supposed to get worse, but I didn't. I got better. And then the doctor wanted to know what's going on. So they brought me back in, did a total full body scan, and they couldn't find one bit of cancer in my body anywhere. And then she said this, you know, I always wondered if it had anything to do with you praying for me. <laughs> now, why is that important? Two reasons. Number one, she had sin in her life. Number two, she didn't have any faith. This was not related to her faith. Because even after she healed, she, she hadn't put two and two together. She said, I wonder if it had anything to do with prayer. <laughs> Number three, I was not at that time noted as someone who had anointing for healing. But God still healed. <clears throat> Sometime later, I was in uh, Slough, London, a suburb, uh, Sloughing, a slough, suburb of London. And by this time, I do have a reputation for healing. And I, people, some people would say, yes, he has a gift of healing. It doesn't mean everybody you pray for gets healed. It just means more gets healed than normal. And, uh, and so I've trained 100 people on the ministry team. And um, there's about 1,000 people there. And we're going, to start, we're going to start praying for the sick. And they, we've kind of, they're kind of lined up. And my team is divided up and they're going everywhere. And we're, we're praying together. And so, um, I know this story because I got a letter from the person later, uh, but I didn't know it at the time. I did. And so, I'm going down the line, and I'm praying, and this woman, uh, I had mentioned about a guy who had been healed at Anaheim when I prayed who had Crohn's disease, and was, he was so bad with Crohn's disease that the doctor said, if you lose more weight, any more weight, we're going to have to take your colon out and put a colostomy on. He was so... Uh, and rightfully so, so fearful of that, that he literally was cheating and he was taking steel ball bearings and putting them in his pockets when he, they would weigh him so it would throw off the weight. And, and I told him the story how the heat came into his abdomen and then he was, next month he went back and the doctor said, you're in remission? He said, no, I was healed. He said, no, you, it's impossible to be healed. You're just in remission. And then about you know, August or so comes by and the doctor says, you're still in remission. And he says, no, I've been healed. The only way to prove it is a uh, colonoscopy. Now, you have to really want to prove your healing <laughs> to ask for a colonoscopy. For those of you that are not yet 50, you'll figure out what I'm talking about one of these days. So he asked for the colonoscopy and the doctor brought him in and said, this, this is 
This has never happened. You see, Crohn's scars your intestines on the inside. There's, there's a scar in his left. And he already had parts of it taken out. And this is going to be the rest of it. And he said, there's no evidence that you ever had Crohn's. There's no scarring. It's like, it's like you have a new colon. So I told that story, and there was a woman there whose sister had Crohn's. And she felt heat come into her abdomen, and she fell out of her chair, went and called her mother. Her sister of Crohn's wasn't a Christian. And so they said the first miracle was to get her to come to church. So she came to church that night. And, then, and so I come down, and I'm going down the line praying for people. And I got to the sister and passed her up, the one with the Crohn's. I didn't do it on purpose. I don't even know why, how it happened. But the, the woman who's writing me the letter, she says, her sister, the believing sister, and she said, I wanted to yell at you. Randy, you've got to come back and pray for my sister. But the Holy Spirit spoke so clearly, don't look to a man, look to me. So I didn't ask you to come back. And so you went on, and I'm praying, okay, God, if not Randy, then the senior pastor... And if not the senior pastor, one of the associate pastors. And if not one, is a huge church. Not one of the associate pastors, one of the assistant pastors. And if not one of the assistant pastors, an elder of the church. But God, nothing less than an elder. <laughs> and she just gets that prayer out of her head when the youngest person on the ministry team, 12 years old, little girl. Uh... <laughs> Can I pray for you? And the Christian sisters think, oh God, no. <laughs> <laughs> and the unsaved sister says, yes. And the little girl puts her hand on her abdomen. And the healing, annoying, began to flow. And she got healed, totally healed of Crohn's disease. She got baptized, accepted Jesus, got baptized. Got off a total disability. Got a job. Got married. And then I get the letter of what had happened and how it had happened. You see, God, would you say this after me? God can use little old me. 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 At the end of this sermon, if you believe that more than you did at the beginning of it, then my, I have been successful in what I wanted to do was to take away Things the enemy says to us to get us to not believe he's going to use us. And that's what this is all about. It's just focusing us on him, on the spirit, and on grace. Do you notice, it's just that one time in the scripture Jesus asked somebody or forgave somebody before he just healed them. He's the ultimate minister of grace. Now, we've talked about faith. We've talked about sin in their life. We've talked about the anointed person. What we haven't talked about is feeling the anointing and move with compassion. I'm skipping two or three more stories. Sorry. Sometimes if I add something, you've got to subtract something later. But I'm going, I'm going to hit two points with one story. I love it when you can do that. <laughs> After Toronto happened in January 1994, suddenly I'm catapulted into ministry. I had had... One invitation in my lifetime to go preach outside of my local church before Toronto. And after Toronto, I've never been able to say yes to all the invitations. I was gone from my wife and kids six nights in 19 years of marriage. I was only gone six nights before Toronto. When Toronto happened, I had a one-year-old, a three-year-old, an eight-year-old, and a 12-year-old, soon to be 13. This was April. Toronto had happened in January. I was in Minnesota. I was at uh, Minneapolis-St. Paul. 
20 some churches invited us in. We had crowds of about 2,000 people in an old abandoned pennies store. We had lots of room. We didn't even have to stack the chairs. We'd just move over to another area. But it's a very difficult meeting. I had been on the road almost 30 straight days, and I was tired, and I was exhausted, and I was suffering from what I call compassion fatigue. Uh, any of you who have raised several small children know what compassion fatigue is. It's where there's been more withdrawals than deposits into your emotional bank. And it doesn't mean you've stopped loving, but you get to a point where you got this weird look in your eyes and you just feel like, if they say mommy one more time, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> say mommy, if he says daddy one more time, I don't know. That's why I feel sorry for people who were not, did not have the privilege of growing up with both mother and father in the house. That was what God intended because he knew that children need an early alarm warning system. I remember growing up, my dad worked two jobs most of his life, 80 hours a week most of his life or more. And sometimes he'd be very nervous. And mom had three kids by 21, didn't have an inside toilet. And dad was gone so much so that it was very hard for her too. And, and so we had the early alarm system. It was this, you know. Mom sometimes would come and say, boys, jo uh, Vicky, my daughter, my sister, dad's really on edge. He's a lot, very nervous, problems at work. Uh, he, he's having to sleep through. He's working night shifts, sleeping in the day. You've got to be quiet. It wouldn't take much to get a whipping. <laughs> An early alarm system. And sometimes it's the other way. Dad would come and say, your mother's on edge. I'm just warning you guys, it wouldn't, wouldn't take much to, to get a whip. It. <laughs> my mom hated it when my brother and I would fight. But brothers are supposed to fight. That's part of the, just part of being brothers. And one time we were raking leaves. And we had a big yard, and lots of oak trees in it. And we were raking leaves. And we were little... And it's boring, raking leaves. They didn't have those blower things then. You know, you had to rake them. And we, in the middle of it, we just got tired of raking. We all of a sudden, we went into fantasy land, and we became knights. And we've got our rake handles. We've turned them around. Now they are swords. Mom looks out the window, and she thinks we're fighting each other. And we're not fighting, we're playing. But Mom thinks we're fighting. She hates fighting. So she came out with the broom handle, and she... Bam, right over my head. Bam, over my brother's head. You guys are liable to hurt each other. And I'm looking with tears in my eyes. Mom, not near as much as you just hurt. That hurt. I want you to know I come from a real family. Just a normal country kid that has experienced the grace of God. So anyway... I'm up there in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and I'm, I'm tired, I'm worn out, emotionally de depleted, and they took me, not to a renaissance, they didn't even take me to Holiday Inn Express, <laughs> I just didn't know where we were going, and we, we went by Motel, I mean, uh, uh, Red Lion Inn, and, and then Red Roof. And then when we passed up Motel 6, <laughs> and then we arrived at this small house. That's okay. But when we didn't, you know, it's one of those, it splits and goes upstairs and go down the basement. When we didn't go upstairs and we started down in the basement, I thought, this is not good. This is not good. And it was an unfinished basement. And they took me into the bathroom. Now, if you flush the toilet, you got to take the lid off and jiggle this or, it, or the water will keep running. And, Do not put a depressed, <laughs> depleted, emotionally evangelist in the dungeon. <laughs> it's not good. I have to say this for the word of faith. They will take care of you. <laughs> for those of you who are evangelists, beware of of going to a church denomination that doesn't believe in evangelists or prophets or apostles 
that just believe in pastor teacher because if you're, <laughs> you won't be treated very well. I'll just put it that way. So anyway, I've got this negative stuff going on. I'm lonely. I'm tired. I'm exhausted. And it, there's a lot of witchcraft going on. And there's a lot of crazy stuff in the meeting. People getting up and screaming on the mic and cursing and bringing in big gulp bottles, uh, big gulp cups and dumping it over people's head and running out. It was a crazy meeting. It was a lot, I mean, there's a lot of opposition to it. And so as this is going on, this, we came to this one night. It was near the end. I'm exhausted. And you know this word, book called Body Language? There's a book written years ago called Body Language. Now, we usually, there's enough, even in the natural, just pick it up, you know, body language. It's more than your words. How many of you are pastors, want to be pastors, ministers, preachers? Just lift up your hand. I've been in ministry 47 years. I'm going to tell you how to have longevity. This is just one of the things. You got to learn how to read your crowd. You got to learn how to read body language. Which means do not let your eyes connect and lock on a black hole. They will suck the annoying right out of you. And it won't take but about 15 seconds. They're the ones that's mad at you. They can't wait for you to get fired or leave. They don't like you. They're sitting there like this and, you know, don't look at them. You got to learn to look to the energizers. You got to look to the ones that's smiling and saying amen. And if you're black, preach your brother. <laughs> My friend Blaine Cook went and preached the first African-American church. His name's Blaine Cook. And they just, you know, they, some, they get so excited, they stand up and it's really exciting. I mean, where I went to seminary, some of the best preaching I ever heard. And 80% of the people in their doctoral program were, were African-Americans. It was amazing. I got a cultural experience. It was uh, my first time there. I ended up on the chair myself, standing up in the chair, crying. and just, just it, it, was, it was awesome. So anyway, my friend Blaine, he's at this African-American church. And, and they said, preach the book, Brother Cook. Make it plain, Brother Blaine. <laughs> I, told, I said, Blaine, if you can't preach in an African-American church, you can't preach. Because <laughs> it's actually a lot easier than other churches sometimes. <laughs> But anyway, this is not an African-American church I'm at. This is a hard place. So I'm tired, and I do not feel compassion. My compassion ended about 10 days ago. <laughs> the last drip of compassion ended 10 days ago. And I just need to go home. And I'm discouraged. And then I said, everybody that wants prayer for the Father's blessing, ha, ha, ho, ho, <laughs> Go over there. 1,500 people. My ministry team, I only had 100. 75 went over there with them. I think, that's not right. No, 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 no. I need something to come back. I'm thinking this. Come back here. You all can't go over there. That's easy. All you go, fill, 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 fill. Don't need that many. Everybody wants healing over there. 500. I only have 25 left. And I, 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 I'm thinking, I'd like to go over there. But I think, well, yeah, but Jesus would have you go over here. So I get over and I get, in line, I get in this line to start. We got 25 of us. We're praying. So I pray for this first. And by the way, body language. I wasn't aware mine was yelling. So what's wrong with you? I prayed nothing happened. So what's wrong with you? I prayed nothing happened. So what's wrong with you? I prayed and nothing happened. So what's wrong with you? I prayed and nothing happened. So what's wrong with you? I prayed and nothing happened. I, what's wrong with you? I prayed. It's actually only fifth person really, but I'm going to get to this guy. So this guy is an old gentleman, very tall, big, broad shoulders, Scandinavian descent. So I said, so what's wrong with you? And he said, my big toes hurt. Now, my body must have yelled at him because he actually recoiled in his chair. He, he literally leaned back and said, no, 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 my big toes do hurt. And you can't minister when your toes hurt. And I thought, his response, man, my body language must be terrible. It kind of woke me up to the reality. So I said, put on your best bedside manner. And I, I said, okay, take shoes and socks off. So he took his shoes and socks off. And I get on my knees and I got a big toe in each hand. 
Now, you guys didn't get the five-step prayer model, but you're supposed to interview them, find out what's wrong, and try and figure out how you're supposed to pray. And then, having made a diagnostic decision of what's wrong, you speak to the condition, and then you'll stop and re-interview. And, and then, if you need to, you can go back through that several times, and you're going to end up with post-prayer suggestion, go and sin no more, or whatever it may be, you know, or you know, thank God for what you did get and wrap it in Thanksgiving and ask for the rest. And, um, <laughs> Or if, you know, if it dealt with unforgiveness, you know, guard your heart and don't let forgiveness come. You know, you post prayer suggestion. So anyway, step number three is speak to the condition. So I'm in step number three. I am speaking to his toes. Big toes, stop it. Stop this hurting. I command you big toes, stop all pain in your big, big toes, stop it. This pain, it stops now. In Jesus' name, I command these toes and I just... Got this impression. Are you aware of what you look like and how stupid you sound right now? You're actually talking to a guy's big toes. It's come to this. And I remember, I actually looked up and just, I hope nobody I went to high school with is here seeing, seeing this. Uh, and I got overwhelmed with discouragement. I looked back and I said, nobody's getting healed. I looked to the right. 495 to go. <laughs> and I actually, I had, here's the second way to have long, um, longevity in ministry is to know when you need to use secret preacher prayer. <laughs> secret preacher prayer. How many of you that aren't in the ministry have ever heard secret preacher prayer? That's my point. It is a secret. <laughs> And the reason why it's a secret is because it's so honest that if you heard it, it would take all your faith away. And so I got his big toes in my hand, and I went into secret preacher prayer underneath my breath. And by the way, you may think this is just the laughing part, uh, part. and it is funny now, now that it's over. <laughs> But my spiritual son in Brazil has told me, Randy, this sermon has helped me so many times when I wanted to quit, when I was discouraged. And so I prayed under my breath. Nobody could hear me. Lord, where are you at? I'm here. Where are you? We're supposed to be co-laboring. Where are you? God, nobody's getting healed. There's 495 more to go. God, I, I don't want to keep doing this. Lord, I'd like to go back to the dungeon and cover up my head and then go home tomorrow. It's what I'd like to do. And then he took me into one of the three visions I've had in my whole life of 65 years. And it's myself. It's a memory bank. When I'm 12 years old, I'm getting ready to ride a horse for the first time since I was seven. You see this big scar right there? That's a horse, horse hoof. It just laid my skin up. You see my skull? Because the horse kicked me back in the pasture when I was walking back there. At another, kicking another horse and hit me. I had a fear of horses after that. Actually a phobia. I just start sweating, nervous. It's been five years and I'm getting ready to ride for the first time. Now, this is the picture God shows me. It literally happened. Shows me my dad speaking to me when I'm about to get on a horse to ride for the first time since I've been kicked in the head. And dad said this, son, if that horse throws you, you cannot go to the house. Because if you go to the house, you may never ride again. And I knew how to interpret it. I knew what it meant. I knew it had nothing to do with riding that horse. It had everything about wanting to go home and not not continuing praying for the sick. And so it steeled me to know I'm not going to the house. And I prayed and I went on, prayed for it. We had quite a few people get healed. I saw a few people get healed. The team saw quite a few get healed. Late at night, when the people are healed, the next day in the meeting, we would have them give their testimony. And I saw the man, the big man, with big toes. <laughs> He's in the line. 
to give his testimony. I am so excited about it. I, I sit on the edge of my seat just waiting to hear his testimony because, man, there was a battle over that guy. And he came to the microphone and he said, I just wanted to let everybody know that last night Jesus healed my high blood pressure. I'm thinking, high blood pressure. He didn't tell me he had high blood pressure. We didn't pray for high blood pressure. What about those toes? I never did find out if his toes were, were healed or not. But what did happen that night when I was in such a bad place as far as not feeling love, not feeling compassion, just feeling my own emptiness, that if I would have allowed the enemy to come to me and say that one of the conditions is compassion and you don't have compassion, therefore, you shouldn't expect God to do anything. I never let the enemy put me on the rug of law. I stand on the rug of grace. And here's what I've learned. When I don't have faith, he does. When I don't have compassion, he does. He can never run dry. When... when when there's sin in the person, he's the sin bearer. Yes. I, I, just, I just stand and minister from grace. Yes, I love all these principles, and I believe they're all important, but they're not more important than the message of grace. <laughs> and for me, most of the major healings I've seen are connected to his grace lets, his what he does in the meeting to create faith rather than my ability to, to manufacture greater faith. I'm so glad that I can say to you, God really does want to use you. And he wants to encourage you this weekend that he will use you. And then when I talk uh, in the next message which is next message is going to be impartation. Um, I'm going to share some stories of people just like you that have come into very powerful healing anointings, both laity and clergy. So I want to pray for you. Oh, one last thing. I got one minute left. I got to use up all my time. <laughs> that night that the guy, big toe situation happened, after it's all over, I went over to the fun stuff. Ha, ha, ho, ho, he, he, pray, and people fall, shake, laugh, all that stuff. And there's only two or three people to pray for. I prayed for them. And I sat down. This woman came over to me, and she said, you look really, really tired. Can I pray for you? I said, yes. So she prayed for me, and I felt, I felt electricity come on me. Thought, That's really nice. And, uh, and, and then... She said, okay, now you pray for me. And I said, Phil. She said, no, no, no. She opened right. No, no, not Phil. Heal. I said, no, no, no. Over there's heal. Over here is Phil. <laughs> and she said, but, but I saw you come over here and I followed you over here. I need healing. She looked, she's like 30 years old. And I said, um, what do you need healing for? She said, I'm dying. I have 28 tumors in my lungs. I got tumors in my neck, tumors in the lymphatic system. I said, okay. We started to pray and she did feel this heat from heaven come on her and in her lungs. And she has a point, had an appointment the next day to see the doctor. And I forgot how many, but it was over 20 some odd tumors just in her right lung. All of them had disappeared by the morning. <laughs> And by the end of the meetings, only one tumor was left about the size of a pea in the neck right here. And I believe that the Lord took care of that as well. Now, in closing, I just want to ask you if you'd like to know what I feel when almost, when 99% of the healings take place that I am get to pray, get to be used of God for. Would you like to know about, you know, feeling the anointing. Yes. What it is I feel. Yes. Would that help you? Yes. All right. 99% of the time when I pray for somebody, I feel nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. 
I don't feel my hands. There have been two or three times that I have been almost electrocuted by God. I'll tell you about that next session. But when it comes to praying for people, I, unlike some people, I know Or Roberts and others who had stuff that happened to their hands, that really helps. I actually know some people I work with. They have that happen to them. They have uh, sensations of the Holy Spirit coming on them that uh, encourages their faith. I don't. I wished I did, but I don't. But here's what I have had happen. A lot of people, when I prayed for them, and I felt absolutely nothing, they felt something. I want to encourage you as you pray. It's all right to ask them, or even to tell them before you pray, you might feel something. Half the people get healed, they don't feel anything, but it's really a little more than half, a little less than half that don't. A little more than half the people that get healed, they do. They feel heat, they feel energy, tingling. Um, and just give them permission. If you begin to feel something, tell me. Because if, when I start out praying, when they begin to tell me what they're feeling, that encourages my mustard seed to grow. Yes. Because I know that my partner has showed up. <laughs> that is encouraging. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you, Lord, to give us an expectant hope and faith for you to touch us, anoint us, and use us. And take us, Father, into a, a place where we're able to see more happen than we presently do. God, I pray for the Holy Spirit to just come and for, Lord, the, the angels that Bani Shabda saw when we prayed 400 pastors down in Charlotte that... Father, I pray that in the name of Jesus that you would release a greater grace and you would mark people and there would be people, everybody here would see an increase in what they see. But I also pray, Father, that there would be some here that you sovereignly choose on the basis of nothing but grace alone. That they become known as a healer, as a worker of miracles, because it happens so much more frequently than it does normally. In Jesus' name, amen.